Good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to IPSS briefing session on Spotlight on Migration, Causes, Consequences, and What the AU Can Do. My name is Amr Abdullah. I am the Senior Advisor on Policy Analysis and Research at IPSS, and I am honored to receive today our distinguished speakers and moderator to uh, run this very important briefing session. We hope that this will be a first in a series of such sessions that we will run throughout the year. And we welcome all of you here. We are very honored today to have with us our speakers, Dr. Mehari Tadella Mero, former Migration Manager of the AU Commission, and Mr. Philip Bob Jusu, Migration Manager, Department of Social Affairs of the African Union Commission. They will be delivering the keynotes and they will take your questions and answers in the, in the discussion session. And the entire session will be moderated by our distinguished moderator, Ms. Sedala Lema, the Editor-in-Chief of ADIS Standard. We welcome all of you here, and I invite Ms. Lema to come to the podium. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Abdullah. Good morning to you all. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I don't think there is any important um, topic right now that's as captivating on all sides of the Mediterranean, both in Africa and in, in Europe, as migration is. So I would like to thank on behalf of you and uh, on behalf of the panelists, the IPSAs, for picking up on this very pressing issue and having these two distinguished uh, panelists to deliver uh, what they think is, is, is uh, about this very complicated and uh, delicate issue. And I'm expecting a few questions to come from, from you, from the participants here. Uh, further ado here, I would like to say, uh, first go to Dr. Mahari to give us his presentation for the next 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. Um, I would like to thank Fadala for, for the kind introductions. And also, I would like to join her in uh, appreciating IPSS for picking this topic and also uh, requesting me to, uh, to contribute to this discussion with this event. Uh, ideas in general, and um, uh, I'm also very happy that Sadat said uh, emphasize on the current program manager who is me. So the half questions will go to him. So I'm former, so that, that's uh, an important distinction to be made. But uh, what I will try to do is an introduction for the hard work that you Philip will be uh, performing today. I just wanted to give you a conceptualization in general that will help uh, frame our discussion on um, um, what they do and specifically which the recent engagement I had with IGA on migration policies, uh, migration related policies that uh, has been developed. So I will discuss a little bit on uh, what we mean by migration and how that is uh, uh, also related to displacement and mobility. Uh, what are the determinants and uh, the frequency, nature and trend of migration in and uh, from Africa? Uh, and perhaps a very helpful uh, aspect that we look forward, especially as input for policy formulation and also even academic engagement is how megatrends in Africa are related to migration and what migration will look like in the future, uh, just uh, uh, a foresight or, or scenarios that has been developed by various uh, institutions studying migration. And also the challenges, concerns and opportunities related to migration, uh, which I think uh, Philip will be dealing more in, in depth uh, when it comes to uh, the challenge of the African Union and perhaps to some degree the regional economic communities and member states are facing. And 
uh, some citations also on what are the missing links in terms of uh, governance of migration in Africa. First, I think it's very important to look at migration again in relation to state and uh, not only the nature of state as cause and consequence uh, with co uh, factors that affect the nature of state or characterize the nature of state and how it has bearings on migration of population but also how it's related to sovereignty of state and increasingly we see that uh, when it comes to human security of population and when it's related to internal displacement or refugee we, we look at protection of individuals citizens mainly within their country within their territory or uh, other people who cross border seeking protection at refugees that we see have a bearing on the sovereignty of the state state being defined whether it provides effective protection or human security to its population and whenever the state is unable to provide that kind of protection human security to its population the, the fact that sovereignty is considered as forfeited uh, by the state and as such many policies that later on we'll look at are framed in this perspective that AU, REX, United Nations and other uh, regional mechanisms, mechanisms serve as subsidiary organizations to provide that human security when state fails to provide that and that is call it as intervention, interference, or whatever uh, name that is given. And the responsibility to protect being redefined as, or reconceptualized as sovereignty, as responsibility. If you see the issue of responsibility to protect, and as such, sovereignty being redefined as responsibility, you'll see it, its roots is in displacement, especially with internally displaced persons, Francis Deng, Roberta Cohn, and others who have written first on the, re the need to reconceptualize sovereignty as responsibility to provide human security has a bearing on migration and uh, internal displacement. And also under international human rights law, we know uh, the duty to respect, protect and fulfill uh, also relate to responsibility uh, of uh, states uh, to their population. And increasingly, we will see later on on, on, on um, uh, migration, especially forms of migration that are forced, that is displacement, you will see that the issue of delivery of basic services to the population and at the same time exercising power, legitimate power within a, a, a country uh, determining uh, the uh, issues related to uh, migration in uh, uh, in a country. And later on perhaps we'll look at if the different uh, causes and consequences of migration are related to human security, how they are related to human security, both soft and hard security. And just to see a, a continuum, I just listed some of the issues, factors that are considered either as soft insecurity, as a cause of migration, or accelerators or triggers. You have extreme events and shocks, floods, um, or natural disaster, volcano, uh, even if it's not natural, uh, drought, which can lead to famine if, when there is no effective, responsive governance responding to drought, uh, or extreme vulnerability of different kinds. A country of origin like Ethiopia and a country of destination like South Africa do not have the same industry. They don't see each other as such uh, in terms of what is the priority. They might agree that protection is important to migrants, but their standing, their premises is completely different. One is to protect its market, the other one is to protect its citizens. And this can happen also within our region, South Sudan, where you have many migrants now, which is not well governed. We may have the next problem in South Sudan in terms of the xenophobic attacks and so on. And these are different, differing, uh, divergent interests and contractory uh, in the states that we see between countries of origin, countries of destination, and countries of uh, 
uh, transit. Years we have developed more than 203 normative frameworks, policies, 43 uh, treaties and conventions. Now we have to move from norm setting to norm implementation. It's time that every penny and every minute of the African Union regs and even member states have to implement this one. Of course, implementation is of the member states. The alpha and omega, at least the omega of implementation are member states. Maybe the alpha, the initiation may come from regs, AU and others. But at least implementation will depend on member states. But there are things that the African Union and regs can do. We have to take these policies down to the member states where they pledge something in Addis Ababa but they don't implement, they forget it when they leave Bole Airport. They have to, to take these pledges actually to the ground to their people. The way of to do that one is to select few countries, the highest countries of origin and perhaps the highest countries of origin every year, uh, a destination, and go there to look where are we in implementing these policies that you have adopted in Addis Ababa, in their capital, not bringing them to Addis Ababa. But the AU has to go to uh, the member states. Philippe has to go to the African, to the member states. We have been trying to do that. We have gone at least to the regs at the norm diffusion. Between norm setting and norm implementation, we have to have norm diffusion. And we have been trying to do that one with the regs to diffuse these norms. But ultimately, the battleground, the decisive battleground will be the capitals and the member states. The second is the building for capabilities in terms of policy response. If possible, we have to build predictive capability on mobility of people, general. Displacement and mobility, migration in general. Responsive capability is much better than, in my opinion, than predictive and preventive capability in most of members, member states, at least in the countries of, uh, in the countries of origin. So we have to address also that uh, the responsive capability of member states when migrants are stranded, they are held in prisons, or they uh, face dangers that they have to, there should be capability to respond effectively, at least at member states, if possible also at Rex and AU level. Of course, adaptive capabilities to situations, especially with climate change induced displacement. We have to have adaptive capabilities. We have to have programs that allow not spontaneous migration, which may lead to different kind of ills in society, but, also, but more planned uh, programs that can help ad the adaptive capability of the society. One aspect is, like we said, cross-border informal trade and movements, which already pastoralist communities are doing it. But we can encourage this kind of arrangement where as adaptive capability... Uh, ...sustainable development of the continent, then there is the need for people to move. Regional integration cannot be sustainable without movement of people. You cannot allow groups to move and leave people behind. Hence, movement, free movement of persons was the backbone of the African economic integration in 1999. Our role as the African Union Commission is to provide guidance to member states. Because of the importance of migration to the African Union Commission, we have come up with a number of frameworks as well as policy instruments. And I would like to name them for you. We have the Migration Policy Framework for Africa, 2006. 2006 was a very important year for migration when it comes to the EU, because it was in 2006 that that document came out. The history of that document, of that instrument, is very much touchy, because it took a number of years for member states to agree on this document. I'm sure the reason for that was our members do not want this document to be binding on them, which is one of the weaknesses of the African Union Commission. But that's something we'll talk about later. We have the African Common Position on Migration and Development. That decision was taken before the AU and the EU met. The reason why I'm giving this background is because we have this idea 
that it is only the European Union that is dealing with migration. It is only the European Union that is talking about migration. It is only the European Union that takes the issue of migration seriously. And I want to say here, the African Union had preceded the European Union when it comes to handling issues of migration. The first time the EU and the EU met to discuss issues of migration was in 2006, prior to the meeting in this country, where they came out with the, Afri the AU, um, the AU EU Declaration on Migration and Development. Then we have the AU frameworks on refugees, returnees, and IDPs, known as the Kampala Convention, when it's non binding on them. They spend thousands of dollars, come to Addis Ababa, sleep in distant hotels, eat good food, take decisions, go back home, and they, like Dr. Mihari said, leave it at the airport. What are we going to do? A long time in the nature of AU membership, I already talked about that. Population explosion. Dr. Mihari talked about that, but I would love to touch on that a little. This is very important because I remember when we were in Khartoum, the Italian foreign minister then said something which was very striking. He said, migration is about numbers. 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 By 1950s, 60s, the population of Europe was almost twice the population of Africa. Today, the population of Africa is almost twice the population of Europe. So whilst we are thinking of population dividend, demographic dividend, the Europeans are thinking that we are going to swamp Europe and overcome them and take over Europe. As a result, people have made political decisions, people have made political careers out of the issue of migration. Today, we are 1.1 billion with the youngest population in the world. By 2020, we are going to be 1.4 billion, as projected. Those challenges are going to remain. If we don't address them, they are going to lead to tension between Africa and Europe. 1960s, there were only two cities in Africa with a population of 1 million, Johannesburg and Cairo, a million plus. Today, we have 42 cities in Africa with more million population, including Addis Ababa. The population of Lagos in 1960 was less than 1 million. Today it is 21 million. People are moving. And when people move, they move with their troubles. Societal perspective of migration, migration as a social prestige. We have societies in Africa where people sell their homes, they sell their cows, they sell their land, and give money to traffickers to take their children from home to elsewhere because the neighboring child has moved and they see what he or she is doing for his family. If you don't move, you are a failure. So regardless of the challenges, regardless of what they hear on the news, they move. The mobility regimes in Africa. Dr. Mihal, we have to be frank about this discussion. And thank God I came here. Restrictive mobility regimes. Like he said, some people are protecting their market, others are protecting their people. But one thing they are doing that I do not appreciate is the restrictive mobility regime. This is the issue we need to talk about. If people have to move, we go to a European embassy, don't give up visa, then we complain. Italy is not giving me visa. United Kingdom is not giving me visa. Switzerland is not giving me visa. I can't even go to the American embassy because they will not entertain my application. Yet, if I want to come to Ethiopia, I would not be given visa, and I'm an African. The position of mobility on the continent. Afraid that migrants are coming. They are coming to take our jobs. They are coming to take our beautiful wives, our best ladies. Let's not allow them to come. When I went to Rwanda, Rwanda is one of those countries Probably the only country in mainland Africa where every African can go without needing the visa. You get visa on arrival. It's the only country on mainland Africa where an African can jump on the plane, go to Kigali, at the airport they give you visa on entry. 
Rwanda has a population of 11 million. Last year, they had 13.4 million visitors. We say migrants are criminals. Rwanda has indicated that not every migrant is a criminal. Out of 13.4 million visitors in Kigali in Rwanda, only less than 4,000 were involved in minor offenses. Address issues of irregular migration. That's a huge challenge. We don't have the capacity. We want to talk about issues of human trafficking. We want to talk about issues of irregular smuggling of migrants. How we can address the challenges of mixed migration. But it's difficult. I know Ethiopia wants to do it. They have the political will. That's why they enacted the anti-trafficking legislation. They come up with a human trafficking policy. Now they are working to come up with other frameworks to address these issues. I know other member states that are working similarly around the clock, but they lack the capacity. This is why the AU is engaging them to see how we can build the capacity, one, of the law enforcement officials, and secondly, of the civil society, the role of the West in the issues that we are facing. Let's be frank. Let's talk about it frankly. I don't know if I'm a diplomat, but I work for the African Union. All our dictators, all our leaders, our corrupt leaders, not all of them, most of our corrupt leaders, keep their monies in Western banks. And these monies are kept by Western leaders. They know the leaders are corrupt. They know our leaders, some of our leaders, not all, are corrupt. Money is meant for infrastructure, money is meant for schools, money is meant for education, money is meant for healthcare, are stolen from Africa, kept in banks in the West. When Africans are moving, they say, no, we have to block our borders. Let's be fair. These people are going in search of their money. <laughs> Let's be fair. You cannot come and bomb Libya. Libya is so stable. People are moving. And he said, no, we are not going to allow these people to come. Where is justice? 